Okay, then I will start, so please. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction, Andre. Um, thank you for the um, well, uh, invitation to speak at your seminar series. Um, it's fantastic to be here. If at any point I mute myself or stop screen sharing, please let me know. It, it's sort of done accidentally. So I'm going to be talking about, oh, let me get onto the right. Um, I'm going to be talking about recent work on the so-called exponential input to state stability property. And this is work currently in peer review, so we're waiting for some views from the academic community. So I welcome your, your thoughts on this. And as usual, I'll provide some background and context to the area to motivate study, but I'm sure for this audience, a lot of this will be, will be known. And as, as noted, this is joint work with Hartman Logerman, who's at the University of Bath. So um, thank you for the biography, as a lot of it's already just been said. I'm a mathematician by training, I had a PhD from 2012, I have some lecturing experience at the University of Bath, and now I'm in Scotland, Edinburgh Napier University. So in the UK, control sits somewhere between maths and engineering, so I was in a maths department and now I'm in an engineering school. So I have a PhD in model order reduction, my early work was in model order reduction, but I work nowadays more in a range of areas, which is a nice aspect of the field including infinite dimensional systems and control theory, nonlinear stability theory, and positive systems. But this talk is today about sort of nonlinear stability theory. So we're going to consider the so-called exponential input to state stability, so ISS, exponential ISS property for this system of um, controlled nonlinear differential equations. As usual, as usual, X is a state variable, D is some external input, also called a forcing term. And so throughout, D is going to be locally essentially bound. So at infinity. And as is known, exponential ISS means I can find some lambda and L positive so that along trajectories I have this kind of exponential decay in my state and linear growth in um, or linear exponential decay in time, linear growth in state, and linear growth in the input as well. So there's always this convention terminology is a system ISS or is it? ISS a property of a trajectory. I'd say really that the zero trajectory is ISS. We're looking at the distance to the zero trajectory, but that's too much to say. So I'm just going to talk about one being exponentially ISS. So I show you the estimates again. So clearly, exponential ISS is a property enjoyed by stable linear control systems. And that qualitatively makes it the best you might expect for in general, because linear systems have exponential decay or exponential ISS. And obviously, it's a stronger property than usual ISS. And of course, your nonlinear control system might be ISS without being exponentially ISS. But it seems to us that the property is not hugely well studied in the literature. I'll get on to some related literature soon. So I have a couple of slides on the ISS property. I'm sure this is very well known by this audience. I suppose this, this helps motivate our work and is my take on the subject as much as anything. So remember, usual ISS, can, you have this estimate in terms of um, a KL function in the state and a K function in your um, input. And of course, more generally, you can formulate ISS in terms of distance to a zero invariant set. But for simplicity here, that set's just zero. So obviously, as is known, this ISS dates back to the work of Sontag, late 80s, and then a flurry of activity activity followed and arguably hasn't really stopped, just sort of kept going. So it's sort of no overstatement, I'd say, that ISS has over the past 30 years uh, substantially reshaped how questions of nonlinear stability are posed and answered in the mathematical controls theory community. In particular, the early research looked at characterizations of the ISS property. So it's well known from the 1990s, Sontag and Wang, characterizations of ISS, that ISS is equivalent to the existence of a so-called ISS Lyapunov function. Okay, it can be smooth, a smooth function V, some K infinity functions which bound my function from above and below, so sort of property, uh, properness or radial unboundedness. And I have this sort of lead derivative or derivative along solutions. I have decay in Z and decay in my state, okay, and growth in my input. And again, as is known, the difficult part of this characterization, I'd say, is establishing the existence of an ISS Lyapunov function, because that's a kind of converse Lyapunov theorem result. And these are difficult, as I understand, they're technical, they're tricky. And this was done by Lin, Sontag, and Wang in this 1996 paper. Okay, more characterizations followed. So the, a year later, Sontag and Wang, this is the new characterizations of ISS paper. 
And then jumping forwards many years, um, Kellis and Dower 2015, and I contain some screen captures from this paper. So they talk about L2 gain. So system two is their ODE. L2 gain with transient uh, gain bound beta. Okay, I have an L2 estimate for my state, which could be nonlinear in my initial state, but it's linear L2 in my input. And then their theorem is that this um, property is sufficient for ISS. And conversely, if your ISS, well, you can find a change of coordinates, a nonlinear change of coordinates, so that your new system has linear L2 gain. So just to outline up front, our results should parallel some of these but in the special case of exponential ISS. So I'm going to collect some definitions relating to this problem. These are just sort of some regularity assumptions. So for fixed z, for fixed first variable, I want my function to be measurable in its second variable for measurable inputs. I, I want that, you know, I want to be able to talk about trajectories unproblematically. So this is a regularity assumption. I'm going to assume zero at zero. So zero is my sort of um, uh, trajectory I'm interested in comparing to. And I'm going to take local Lipschitz in the first variable uniformly with respect to the second variable. So from you know, standard theory of ODEs and existence of trajectories, this exact, this guarantees existence of what we call pre-trajectories. So these are functions which satisfy this almost everywhere, but they might only be defined on um, uh, bounded intervals. So pre-trajectories pre which are defined everywhere, we call trajectories. And natural to have trajectories when you're studying stability, you want to know what happens over long times. And so forwards completeness here is the idea that all pre-trajectories are in fact trajectories. <clears throat> so notice that H1, H2, and H3 by themselves don't guarantee yet existence of all pre-trajectories are trajectories. Right? You could have finite blow up, but we'll rule that out quite quickly. So I said this already, the exponential ISS property is forwards completeness and existence of some um, positive lambda and L such that, okay, I have this um, exponential decay in time, linear growth in state and linear growth in input. I want that to hold for all trajectories. And so an exponential ISS Lyapunov function is essentially um, a quadratic ISS Lyapunov function. So I want it to grow and be bounded from above and below Exponent, um, quadratically, I'm sorry, in my state. And I have this kind of quadratic decay along solutions with possible quadratic growth in the input. And then we have a third property, which we're going to call linear state input to state stability, um, L2 gain. Sorry, I said that again, linear state input to state, so SIS L2 gain. So I want forwards completeness, that's part of all of these assumptions. And I want constants alpha one, alpha two, so that I have this L2 estimate along trajectories. So it's L2, L2, um, so linear growth in the states, linear growth, L2 norm of the input. Okay. So what we will show under assumptions is that these three properties are equivalent. Exponential ISS is equivalent to the existence of an exponential ISS Lyapunov function, that itself is equivalent to linear SIS L2 gain. That's the sort of first part of this work. And then the second part is that a natural small gain condition is sufficient for exponential ISS of a feedback connection of two exponential ISS systems. Okay, as is often the case with research, we wanted this result for something else. We sort of ended up going down the rabbit hole of this line of inquiry because we wanted to do something else. Depending on how I'm doing with time, I may get to that. But so we're trying to solve a different problem. Turned out this would be a useful thing to know. And then, of course, natural question is, well, hasn't this been done? Isn't this known? So the next few slides, I'm going to talk about some questions which we asked when thinking about these problems, because as you talk, natural question for us was surely this is known. So I have natural observations and questions, putting some of this together. So the first thing is that obviously ISS has powerfully moved stability theory beyond linear systems. So why bother studying exponential stability property, exponential ISS property? And I guess the answer we had to that was that nonlinear control systems can exhibit this property, right? Particularly Luray systems, which is one of the areas I sort of work in quite a lot. So my understanding 
thing is that Lure is an anglicization of a Russian name. There are other anglicizations in the literature, like Lure, Lure, sometimes also Lure Postnikov. So these are these are the feedback interconnection of a static linear system sigma and a sorry, a linear system sigma and a static nonlinear output feedback, so G. So in closed loop here, you get a system of differential equations, x dot is ax, plus or minus, depending on your sign convention for the feedback, b, g, c, x. So they have sort of, they're nonlinear, but with nice structure. And as I guess it's well known, one strand of absolute stability theory asks, suppose I know that a corresponding linear system is stable. Well, when can I infer that a, a nonlinear system is stable, when g satisfies some properties? Because non, uh, linear stability analysis is much easier than nonlinear stability analysis. So absolute stability is for a very old discipline. Um, it focused both on sort of state space asymptotic stability, but also L2 or L infinity stability using input output methods. There are a whole host of classical absolute stability results. I've written some down here. And it's known that versions of these results guarantee global exponential stability when unforced. And over the past 20 years, I said, there's been a lot of interest in finding out, well, can I strengthen these results, circle criteria, complex seismic conjecture, and so on, so that they guarantee ISS as well, which is obviously a stronger property. And sometimes they guarantee exponential ISS. So this work dates back to Arkak and Thiel, early 2000s, and then Hartmut with a PhD student in 2015, and then more, more recently, me and Hartmut, there we were considering the... Um, let me get this right, a strong double I double S property. So a variant of ISS. And then actually where we push this as far to is to study infinite dimensional Blue Array systems. So shown in the uh, block diagram here, we looked at the exponential ISS and exponential incremental ISS. So looking at the difference between trajectories, not just a trajectory in zero, but two different trajectories for the feedback arrangement shown where Sigma is a so-called well-posed linear system. So L2 well pose, L2 inputs get mapped somehow to L2 outputs so that frequency domain methods, transfer functions and so on work very nicely. And in this work, so this is, um, this is a Cycon paper from 2019, we use small gain exponential weighting arguments to avoid Lyapunov theory, which is tricky or technical in infinite dimensions. I just suppose just note here that incremental stability is very useful if you're trying to study convergence properties, say to a periodic or almost periodic solution. It gives you a kind of toolbox to use for that. So our answer to the first question is some systems do seem to exhibit the exponential ISS property. Okay, the second natural question, well, isn't this all known, right? How about this 1999 paper by um, Lars uh, Sontag and Fabian about asymptotic stability equals exponential stability? Okay, so I showed the abstract, maybe it's better on the next slide. A key result of that paper is that Asymptotic stability is the same as exponential stability, and ISS is the same as input to state exponential stability, so ISES, up to, in general, nonlinear change of coordinates in the state space. So here I have my um, this first term. Yes, I have exponential decay in time, linear growth in the state, but I maybe have a nonlinear growth in my input. However, as the authors know, right, the change of coordinates is not constructive, right? it's existential. And it, I suppose with my sort of applied hat on, it need not respect any physical interpretation of the states of the original model. So that might be a consideration in a sort of applied example. So I wonder if, that, I, I don't know this, I wasn't in academia at that time, I wonder if that just sort of ended the discussion of the exponential ISS property. Can you say, well, actually, it's not so different up to a coordinate transformation of general ISS, let's just study general ISS, or whether it's that it's so tied up with linear systems that they thought it's not that interesting a property to study. But the upshot is we are not aware of systematic studies of the exponential ISS property in the literature. So then another natural question is, well, all of these general results are out there, does this just follow special cases? And the answer, I guess, not to the best of our knowledge. Because although we impose quite strong assumptions, we're asking for strong conclusions. We're asking for exponential properties to come out. And these very general results don't always seemingly give us that, at least to the best of our knowledge. And then, of course, slightly awkward question is, well, could you have done this 30 years ago? And yes, I expect it could have been. So a very natural question, as I say, I wasn't around when ISS was being first you know, developed in, in academia, in the literature. 
Why wasn't it done then? And I guess maybe so tied up in linear systems. So that's our sort of, these are the thoughts we went through when doing this work or before doing this work. And again, I welcome any, I welcome later any thoughts on these, but I'll now proceed to discuss our results. So we're gonna approach the exponential ISS property by relating it to a uniform global exponential stability property of a related system. So I consider my differential equation again, x dot is f of x and d, but now I have a different interpretation, right? D is just some measurable function which takes values in a compact set, non-empty compact set, and the collection of those are called MD. So we call one UJES, uniformly globally exponentially stable, if I take forwards complete, that's always required, and I get this exponential decay, but notice that that holds uniformly in D, D belonging to MD. So a consequence of this, for example, is that f of zero d is zero because the zero trajectory um, is zero. Uh, x equals zero will always satisfy that equation um, irrespective of what d is. So in the literature, this is sometimes view viewing d as a sort of unknown parameters or a multiplicative disturbance. It's a different notion of stability to exponential ISS. So this property will turn out to be very, very useful. And we have a characterization shown on this next slide. Okay, quite a lot on this, I'll, I'll talk through it. So our, our sort of standing assumptions for regularity and existence of solutions, whoops, sorry. And I'm assuming that this function f is globally Lipschitz in its first variable, uniformly with respect to its second variable in compact sets. So the following statements are equivalent, you, the uniform global exponential stability property, well, there's a Lyapunov characterization in terms of the existence of a C1 function V, which is quadratic uh, in growth, decays quadratically along solutions, and has linearly bounded gradient. Okay, then there's an integral characterization. There exists some P and a constant alpha P. Okay, I need forwards completeness as always. And now I have the following integral estimate along solutions. So if I integrate a piece power, well, I can bound that by a piece power where I started from. So if you plug in an exponential into this, you see you get the kind of corresponding estimate. And then I was running out of space on the slide. So same statement as three, but now for every, it doesn't matter what positive P you pick, for every positive P, you can find an alpha P such that the estimate six holds. So um, as I'm sure you can sort of see where this is going, the difficult part of an ISS um, characterization is the converse Lyapunov part, at least to the best of my knowledge, and this theorem gives us a Lyapunov, or what will become an ISS Lyapunov, an exponential ISS Lyapunov function. So that's why this theorem is brought in. So this is kind of closely related to a known results in the literature. As I've just said, it's presently the key converse Lyapunov function result. So this Lyapunov characterization of UJES is sort of based on uh, Krasovsky, uh, Stability of Motion, book from the 1960s, also that Milex, Milex, uh, a paper it was published in Russian first and then in English a year later, 1979. And in a way, this is a sort of exponential version of the, the converse Lyapunov paper I've already mentioned by Lin, Sontag and Wang. But we're, we're working with exponential concepts, so that's sort of okay. Okay, the integral characterization of UJES is sort of known from this kind of Teal and others paper from the early 2000s. I mean, that paper considers differential inclusion, so much more general results. Okay, a specific case of when the, of the integral characterization with P is 2 appears by Magretsky and Ranser, 1990s. And I make a comment that the global Lipschitz assumption in the first variable is made so that we get this linear boundedness of the gradient. Yeah, gradient of V less than or equal to AZ, A times Z in norm, A4 times Z in norm. And that will become important for fulfilling the definition of an exponential ISS Lyapunov function. So um, I just give an outline of how this result is proven. Um, the following implications are kind of routine. If you have a Lyapunov function, then you generally integrate that along solutions and you get the, the stability property you're after. And then if you have the stability property and you integrate that, where well, you get the integral inequality for any P, and obviously if it holds for any P, then it holds for some P. So the trickier directions are the remaining two shown. The first one, the heavy lifting really is done by the Teal and others paper. You can imitate their arguments. And 
the, U, the existence of a UJ3 Athenoff function where they have to come from somewhere. In this case, they come from integrating solutions. So, okay, you integrate, you start some initial state x0, some input d, integrate that, but that still depends on d. So you supremize okay, the soup over d, and then you usually smooth v1 somehow to get your the Athenoff function v. I wanted to comment that this integral characterization is often called Dapko's theorem in the infinite dimensional setting, right? And there's a sort of corresponding version, at least for linear sort of C0 semigroups and so on. Okay. So armed with this result, equipped with this result, I now give you our, the, main, the first main result of this talk. So we're returning to the first interpretation of our forced control differential equation. So D is locally essentially bounded. Consider one, assume that my standing assumptions, regularity assumptions hold, and the really strong assumption is that this function is globally Lipschitz, in, it's a function of both its variables. Under these assumptions, I get the following statements are equivalent. Exponential ISS is equivalent to the existence of an exponential ISS, the Athenoff function, is equivalent to having SIS L2 gain, and then actually as fourth a condition, is equivalent to the so-called weakly, robustly, exponentially stable property which means that this sort of auxiliary or related system is UJ. So okay, particular choice of phi, it's a constant times the norm of Z. And D here, closed unit four. So UJ has had to come in somewhere in order to bring in the converse, the Athenov result earlier. That's why, that's why it plays a role. So yeah. Um, so main result of this talk, take nothing else away then, Take this exponential ISS equivalent to an exponential ISS, the Athenoff function, linear SIS L2 gain. So remember that's an L2 bound, which has linear growth in state and linear growth L2 of input. And this is probably what you would hope for. It's sort of maybe unsurprising in that sense. Um, it's good to know that it's true. So I won't give the proof. I'll just sort of give some of that, indicate the outline of it. So if you have exponential ISS, then this auxiliary system is weakly, robustly, exponentially stable. We can use direct estimates for that. If you know something is UJES, then you would hope that you get a Lyapunov function out, and that's the case, that's B. So this uses this converse direction, the converse Lyapunov function direction of the UJES theorem. Okay, you have to do a bit of work to show that that is actually an exponential ISS Lyapunov function, but it is, it's okay. And then of course, once you have a Lyapunov function, you would expect the stability property, you know, integrate along solutions and so on. So that's C. Okay, so that there's that's equivalence of statements one, four, two, because that completes a little chain. How do you bring statement three into play? Well, linear SIS L2 gain tells you something about the L2 norm of your state, right? But that, that appears in our UJES characterization. So now we use estimates, but we use the integral characterization of the UJES theorem. That tells me that some related system is weakly, robustly, exponentially stable. So that brings three into the chain above, but I still need to find something which is sufficient for three. And if you have an exponential ISS Lyapunov function, well, integrating that slightly differently using L2 norms gives you linear SIS L2 gain. So each one of these steps takes a bit of work, but not too bad overall. <clears throat> so. Right, so I'm going to move on to feedback connections now. So we're going to consider the feedback connection shown. Uh, I've got a nonlinear control differential equation, but now I have two inputs because I have a feedback variable and an external input. Okay, and then I have some nonlinear outputs. We impose similar regularity assumptions on F so that we can talk about existence of pre trajectories, and then we would want pre trajectories to be trajectories, so that's all fine. And again, I'm working around zero, and I could shift coordinates to zero otherwise. So I show my uh, system again. So the following definition is sort of hopefully um, clear. Exponentially input to output stable iOS. If forward's complete, so I can talk about this for all time, and I can find positive constants so that my output, okay, so I have my exponential decay in time, linear growth in the states, and then I have linear growth in U, so feedback variable and external input. You could lump those two together. You could lump them into one term, but these constants MI and NI I want to separate because I only want ultimately to make assumptions on MI. 
So we connect these in a sort of obvious way, a feedback interconnection. I show you the iOS property again. So here's our main result. Consider the feedback um, interconnection at seven and eight. Assume that both systems are exponentially iOS and exponentially ISS. If your constants M1, M2 are less than unity in, as a product, then the feedback connection is exponentially iOS or exponentially ISS from external input D1, B, D2 brought together to overall output Y1, Y2 or overall state X1, X2. So there is a very famous result in this area, um, uh, taking a screen capture from it by Zhang, Thiel and Prali back in 1994, where the sort of um, uh, generalized small gain theorem for these sorts of properties is investigated. So they assume these bounds 17. So these are ar you know, arbitrary um, K functions or KL functions. Okay, I have this practical part. This is a positive constant, D1 or D2. Okay, you need some coupling between output and state. So they have this thing as the unbounded observer or unbounded observability property. And then they have this small gain condition 18. And they say, well, if that holds, then your feedback system has these nice desired properties right it itself is input output practically stable so that's a much 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 more general result than ours very very powerful result but as far as we can tell it's very difficult to actually use that result to conclude exponential ios if you start with exponential ios so and i guess that's because they're working so generally that they don't impose or make use of the extra structure that we that we impose and um, I, I comment also there's a discrete time version of this result as well. Um, so uh, I have some comments on this result. So obviously, if a state feedback is used, then your hypotheses coincide. ISS is the same as IOS. And notice that we don't need to impose a Lipschitz assumption here. We're already assuming that something is exponentially ISS and IOS. And you could have a practical version of these results by adding an additive constant onto the end. And just as a sort of um, maybe a slightly niche point, we don't actually use very much the xi solves the differential equation. Really, what we want is that there's some sort of causality going on and how it depends on inputs. And it's causality plus the exponential estimates, which are essential. Here. So that might be useful if you want to use this sort of argument in a different place. Right? So how is this proven? Well, sort of once you see it, it's quite straightforward, I think, if it just takes a moment to see it, perhaps. I've got these two estimates, right? I have my IOS estimate first, the exponential IOS estimate, my exponential ISS estimate second. I introduce this matrix S, and hopefully you can see from the sort of block structure that as kappa gets large, the spectral radius of this is really determined by the product of M1 and M2, and that's less than one by assumption. So for large enough kappa, this is sort of sure or discrete time stable. So what we're doing from these estimates is going to extract a discrete time linear difference inequality. So I'm going to set pi to be a norm of yi. The k tau is fixed over increments of kappa. And then hopefully you can sort of see from the equations that you get some sort of difference inequality involving um, p1, p2, q1, and q2 involving this term s. And then that's a discrete time positive linear difference inequality, so a stable one. So you can say conclude stability for that. And then you can convert a discrete time estimate to a continuous time. Okay. So one of the things we thought about was um, can you say anything about the decay rate of the closed loop system? Because you know it's exponentially ISS, exponentially IOS. So how can, you, can you try and quantify that constant? So we go to our proof, what do we find? Um, any theta which is positive and bounded by this quantity, so one over kappa log of one over spectral radius of S is a decay rate. Notice though that even to compute that, I would need knowledge of all of these constants. So or maybe already that's not likely, but you could ask, how does this perform? So we consider the case D equals zero for, because it's a decay rate, it's independent of the input. So as a comparison, we use the ground truth of being a linear system, right? a linear feedback system shown here in that equation nine. So this feedback interconnection or this 
closed loop system is, is, is stable whenever the product M1, M2 is less than one, and the largest decay rate can show analytically is one minus the square root of M1 times M2. So th this, these subsystems in nine sort of trivially satisfy the hypotheses of our bigger result, and all, many of the constants are equal to one, which is nice, makes the sort of analysis a bit easier. And because in fact you're using a input an output is equal to a state, that matrix S I had is actually a bit smaller. It's only two by two rather than four by four. So S in this case simplifies. Okay, so this is sort of some sort of kind of baby analysis. Um, you can compute its uh, spectral radius and then that gives you how big kappa needs to be. Remember kappa is a quantity which we just posited existed. And then viewing that upper bound one over kappa log of one over rho of S, Viewing that as a function of kappa, you can show that that has a maximum on k infinity, uh, k kappa star infinity. So we're plotting against square root of m1 times m2, the maximized upper bound, of f max, and the known exponential decay rate, theta max, and then the quotient of these things. So my um, axis labels haven't worked very well in Vima. But, so as m1, m2 product square rooted increases, the decay rate of the feedback system is the dotted line. That, that behaves like one minus X. So that's just a straight line. And my upper bound is the black line. And of course, it's maybe quite hard to see how well that's doing. So if you take the quotient of them, you sort of see it does best at small M1, M2, where it's 0 0.9 of the true bound. And at big M1 and M2, it's 0.1. So, I mean, it performs well at smaller, um, uh sort of feedback strengths i guess and less well at larger and that gets worse we could argue it's the same order of magnitude so maybe we didn't do too badly but one thing one could think about is well could we tighten up our proof right our proof was just to make it work rather than to try and squeeze out an optimal decay rate but of course the challenge i have is that in a non-linear example how do you what's your ground truth other than i guess simulating it a number of times so anyway, that was one line of inquiry Okay, so we have a small gain, I'll tell you the result, excuse me, sorry, wondering stop that. <clears throat> so we need um, the concept of linear state input to output L2 gain. So again, we want forwards complete, and now we want an L2 estimate for our output. That's, this, should, this looks a lot like the linear SIS L2 gain we had earlier. So it grows linearly in states, linearly in L2 norm of um, control input, linearly in L2 norm of disturbance or forcing term. So as I write here, in the case that uh, state feedback is used, this, this collapses to linear SIS L2 gain. And then we have the following proposition, that if both of your subsystems have linear SIS L2 gain, linear SIO L2 gain, and your constants beta one, beta two, are less than one is a product, then your feedback interconnection has the same property, linear SIS L2 gain, linear SIO L2 gain. So I repeat the proposition. The proof of this is really kind of straightforward. It's, it's kind of trivial, right? You can estimate Y1 in terms of U2, but U2 is equal to Y1. Um, I get that right and so um just algebraic manipulation drops out the yi uh drops out the the estimates for y and again these assumptions of linear sis gain or sio gain coincide if yi equals xi the reason this results are quite useful though we think is that if your fi are additionally globally Lipschitz then our, by our earlier theorem, the assumptions that your subsystems have these SIS L2 gains are equivalent to them being exponentially ISS. So you can change your hypotheses, but actually also you can change your conclusions by noting that your um, overall feedback system is exponentially ISS. So actually, as it seems in some examples for us, ver verifying the linear I've missed the word linear there. The linear SIS or SIO L2 gain property seems easier and sharper than verifying the corresponding exponential IOS estimate. Okay. So 
again, knowing my background, it's maybe no surprise that I'm keen to try and apply this to Lure systems. So I write one down in equation 10 there, x dot is ax plus b psi to distinguish it from f, which I've already sort of used. Okay, I have some output, maybe with a forcing term, b e v, b e v. And we're going to assume for simplicity that A is the linear part is stable, so Herbert's all eigenvalues of negative real parts. And we have a transfer function G. And if A is not stable, then typically what we do is loop shift. So I move it by an output feedback, plus or minus A, B, K, and that introduces an error, but I can accommodate that into the nonlinear term. So it's not really a loss of generality. Okay. So I recall my Lure system. I can fit this into the framework we've just had. I have a linear system for my um, F1, my first term. My second system is static. I don't really, it's just an output feedback, static output feedback. So I introduce a state artifactually to fit the framework, but you don't have to do that. So I have CX1, is, that's my first output. And then my second output is a nonlinear function of my input. So the idea being is that I want to apply this earlier feedback connection result. So since my first subsystem is linear, I can write out the solution in terms of this variation of parameters or variation of constants formula. And then using the A is stable, I can take L2 estimates of this. And everything sort of drops out nicely. I get some constant alpha 1. Importantly, I get my H infinity norm of my transfer function times my control input. And then some constant gamma 1. Don't really care about those two. Okay, G here is this H infinity norm. And then assuming that psi satisfies this sector condition, um, psi of Z is bounded in norm by beta two of times Z, then I, I get the straightforward estimate for Y2, right? Beta two. There's no state here, so my constant alpha one is just zero, the alpha two is just zero, beta two, and then okay, beta two for the second forcing term. So if I display those two equations again, <clears throat> now we can see they sort of fit into the framework, obviously. So whenever this product beta 2 times GH can be less than 1, from our earlier proposition, the Lure system has linear SIS. The overall feedback connection has linear SIS or SIO L2 gain. Now, if psi is additionally Lipschitz, but with any Lipschitz constant, and that's not important for the sort of stability result, then actually I can further include from the theorem that I have um, exponential ISS. So I comment here that you could have arbitrary Lipschitz constant. So this, this sort of line of, this result is known, but this is a different way of arguing about it. And of course, once you've established the earlier theorems of the talk, then actually it's very, very straightforward to um, implement. Okay. So uh, how am I doing for time? How long should I talk for? Well, you still have 10 minutes. Okay, super. All right. So, um, uh, I think I will skip this part and I'll say just one more thing. So we, well, we, we had an application in mind of sample data integral control. And it turns out that using a small, uh, using a, viewing this as a feedback interconnection and then using this result helps with the overall stability analysis. Of that. But I won't, I'll just, um, I will skip this. Okay, the final thoughts I will present is on smoothing an exponential ISS diagonal function. So recall the earlier characterization of the UJS property. Okay, theorem, the following equivalent, I've only shown statements one and two, that the UJS property is equivalent to the existence of a continuously differentiable function B and positive constants so that five holds. So why only C1, right? Why, why haven't I written there exists a smooth function B there? That's what I'm going to talk about for the last few minutes. <coughs> so again, following this paper, Lin, Sontag and Wang, they construct a function V, which is smooth away from their attractor, which is this curly A. For us, that's just zero. They're treating a more general case. So by carefully using kind of convolution, mollifying, partition of unity arguments, which is quite careful. So we could strengthen our conclusions to say that our function D is C1 everywhere and smooth away from zero. We, we chose not to do that because we thought it didn't add that much, but maybe we should have done it. And then this 
proposition 4.2 of the same paper, well, that smooths the function everywhere. However, the problem for us is, is that they're prepared to smooth the function in a way which would change our estimates. In particular, we couldn't guarantee, I think, that it would no longer behave quadratically. Remember the estimates five. Okay, I want quadratic growth and uh, quadratic bounds. I want linear uh, quadratic decay along solutions, and I want linear bound for the gradient. So actually, it's not currently sure. We're not sure how you could smooth V to all of R n and still satisfy five. Now there is some very very general literature on this, right? This is a um, uh, recent paper which looks at smoothing the Apanov function, but they seemingly don't address dissipation rates. That's the problem. We would want to smooth the function and retain the quadratic dissipation rates. But at face value, you think it shouldn't be that hard because you're trying to generalize the quadratic Lyapunov function shown, right? They're just the, the humble V in a product with PV, where P is some solution of a Lyapunov equation. And that, of course, is smooth. So I don't know if this is really a deep result or whether we're just missing something obvious there. So we get a continuously differentiable function. We could smooth it <clears throat> away from zero, but smoothing on all of our end, we currently don't know what to do. OK, so I sort of summarized what I thought about. So I've considered the exponential ISS property for the system of nonlinear controlled differential equations. <laughs> and under the assumption um, that f is Lipschitz as a function of two variables, then exponential ISS is equivalent to the existence of an exponential ISS Lyapunov function and the linear, I missed the word linear again, linear SISL to gain property. And again, to the best of our knowledge, these results aren't currently available in the literature. We're sorry if we've missed them. And um, they don't follow as consequences of existing results because those results tend to be much, much, much more general. And we essentially prove this by exploiting the uniform global exponential stability of this related problem x dot is f of x and then d phi of x for a particular phi and a characterization of UJES was given or recalled. Okay, and then armed or equipped with this, um, if you put the feedback into connection of two exponential ISS systems, ISS, IOS, then their feedback into connection enjoys the same property. And I guess the novelty there is that you can conclude the nature of the stability of the feedback system. It's not just ISS, it's exponentially ISS. And then, of course, you, one can also do that in terms of these L2 gain properties, linear L2 gain properties, and then make a connection between that and exponential ISS. And so, as I've already said, um, Lure systems fall into this framework. And again, thank you very much for the invitation to this seminar. Um, thank you for listening. Welcome any questions. And um, I've got some references, which are the things which appeared in the footnotes. So if you ever choose to look at those, there they are. Okay, thank you.